Hi, I'm Pastor Ralph Douglas West, pastor of the Church Without Laws, and I'm so excited that you've joined us today. Our heart is to usher lost souls to Christ, empower believers to our spiritual maturity, and I'm thrilled to share that heart with you today through the life-transforming power of the Word of God. I also want to invite you to get a daily encouragement by signing in for my free devotional at ralphdouglaswest.org. Now, let's hear today's message. Be encouraged. God's choice of the unlikely. If it was not a cold day, it must have felt like December, 39 degrees, Cold, misty, foggy for Samuel that particular day while he had been pining over King Saul. He had known Saul all of his kingly life. He met him at age 30 in the junk heap that he hid in before Samuel told him to come out you're God's choice. 42 years King Saul would reign and Samuel would be prophet, pastoral counsel and advisor to him. But now he wept. Was he weeping because of his failed prophetic ministry was Samuel weeping because the lack of prophetic fulfillment or some misstep in his ministry no he wept because he loved King Saul and he saw promise in a person unfulfilled he grieved as he reflected upon that very moment in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel where he had to say to King Saul in rebuking terms, you know you, you should not have done that. He wept because King Saul's life mimicked a sinkhole that swallows whole houses and parts of streets underground because of the lack of liquid that dissipates in the dry season and there's no replacing. And now that which is above is too heavy to be sustained by that which is below. And he wept. Inconsolably, he wept for King Saul because he knew that the words that none of us want to say about a fine leader, God had rejected him. Rejection had dogged the steps of King Saul from the very beginning. It was never God's intention for democracy. Israel was theocratically governed, but the people wanted a king, and so God is so kind that there are times he'll give you what you want, even when he knows what you want is not best for you. Why are you weeping? I rejected Saul. Turn loose of your prophetic pacifier. Nurse at that breast no longer. I'm sending you on a specific mission with detailed instructions. Get your flask of horn olive anointed oil. Pack up and go to Jesse's house in Bethlehem. For I have provided for myself a king. (laughs) 
everything about that statement alarmed Samuel. Go to Jesse's house. Who is Jesse? <laughs> you said that like I supposed to know who he is. Although he's related in this Ruth Obed story, I, I don't know him. And then you're asking me to go to Bethlehem. Now, you know, geographically, I can't get to Bethlehem from Ramah without going through Gibeah. And if Saul gets word, especially the way he's been behaving lately. I may have heavenly authority, but he has earthly military. And there's nothing to prevent him from executing this unjust judgment upon me. God says, well, I figured that out. I knew you'd have some reluctance. So, you know, according to Leviticus, you can go and make a sacrifice. So take this cow and march it with you these 10 miles south of Rama and you go on and uh, offer sacrifice. The way you do it, have a big church service and invite everybody to come hear you preach one of your last sermons and make sure that Jesse and his sons are in attendance. By that time, a sacrifice that never sounds so good to the prophet Samuel. When he gets to the outskirts, he's met by the elders in the city council and their eyes widen when they see the prophet Samuel because they had read the local paper, the Bethlehem Chronicle. And that was a featured article in the political section that there had been a falling out between King Saul and Prophet Samuel. This was big headline news, nothing fake about this. <laughs> and they wanted to know one thing if you're reading, I'm around verse five and six now. He says, I just want to know if you come in peace. And he said, yeah, I've come in peace. I come to have a church service. And those elders were so glad to see that sacrifice. They didn't know what to do. He put on the liturgical worship and invited the people. And it didn't take long to see Jesse and he'd be identified and his handsome sons. Eliab comes in and Samuel said, this is the easiest prophetic appointment I've ever had. I, I know who the king is. It's Eliab. He's six, five. He's 240 pounds. He's athletic. He's agile. He's charismatic. He's conversational. He's handsome. That's it. And God said, don't you move too fast. That's what got you in trouble the first time. <laughs> Paying attention to outward appearances. Uh, I told you in verse one that I've made a choice of who I want to be the king. In the Hebrew, that word choice, some of you have it, I provided for myself a king. It really means I, I see the one that I want to be my king, I see. And so the, the word that's operative in the story in verses 1 through 13 is the word to see. It's based on seeing. God sees. Now Samuel sees. But he sees the same way that in previous chapters, Israel saw when they looked at Saul as a prospect of king. They described him, that he was 
head and shoulders above everybody else. It spoke of his height. It said nothing about his character. And all of us better be aware that we might want to start with character before we start looking at constructions. Yeah. It must have been heartbreaking for the prophet that day to hear God says, not him. <laughs> not him? Yeah, yeah, not him. Yeah, but he fits the criteria of what we need. Yeah, I know. But, but you, you, you still have your sights on the superficial. You know what happened when we did that in the past. You had to rebuke the king. And then you had to distance yourself from the king. And now you have no associations with the king. And now he's living in rejection because of his rebellion. You don't want to repeat the same process. You don't want to start weeping again. Unconsolably, do you? No. He said, not the one. We, we live in a culture that's based off of externals. Uh, I've seen this with men. They meet a woman and they size her completely up by her externals. They just forget that age brings about change and alterations. And then suddenly they want to get a slip for an exchange. Uh, I mean, men are not only guilty of this, women are too. Uh, they size up their future by some external frame. And they forget he too changes. In many ways, changes faster then she changes. Physiques fail. Virility falters. And sometimes even earning capita dissipates. If you build your relationships on what you can see only, you might not last for the future. Character makes the difference. Character is that part of you that nobody sees. It's who you are in the private, period. I used to hear my pastor say that character is who you are in the private when no one sees you. And then he said, period. Uh, we live on externals in this country. We're in the basketball season now and we're predicting who's going to make it to the conference finals and then to the championship. Uh, fans of basketball uh, have all these stories and so when you see Golden State Warriors, your mind can almost automatically go back to young Steph Curry, the son of Dale Curry, who was one of the best shooters himself in the basketball game, a graduate of Virginia Tech. When Dale Curry moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, Steph Curry went to a private high school, a Christian high school. He showed promise. He took that school to the championships. Upon graduation, interestingly, he wanted to go to the University of North Carolina, but that was a dead end. No. Well, if he can't get into UNC, then certainly he can get into state. No. Dale tried to get him into Virginia Tech. And uh, they said, no, we'll let him come as a walk-on, but not as a player. You see, they, 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 they saw him. 
his appearance is 6'2", 163 pounds. And all of the best coaches in the game said he can't compete. This is what we do. I'm an expert at this, and we see that he can't. He doesn't have the muscular tone. He doesn't have the speed and energy. He just can't compete with these big players. His high school coach made a call to Davidson College, and he said, oh, yeah, I know, I know Steph. He said, send him down here. He said, I like him. I like what I see. I like his character. I like his behavior. I like what I see. Many of us remember when he made the cover of Sports Illustrated. Who is this young Steph Curry? Then other of us remember that big NCAA championship game. Georgetown, the Hoyas got their foot on the neck of Davidson because, I mean, no little college like that has any business being in that game, you see. They're undersized, under man. And they're down about 30 points or more, I remember this. And, and they put in Steph Curry. Six two hundred six to three pounds, and and people that don't know the game got excited to see this little redhead, green eyed, not supposed to be a baller like this, take the game over ten points, twenty points, thirty plus points. The rest is history the best shooter in the NBA, overlooked because he didn't look like he should be able to play. Be careful of appearance. I'm going somewhere. The coach at Davidson said the opposite. He said, I like what I see. I'm not looking at 6'2", 163. I'm not looking at tonation and complexion, agility or speed. I'm looking at something that we don't talk about. I'm looking at behavior and attitude and leadership and character. I'm looking at something that we don't see. Character, who you are when nobody's looking. When you can get away with whatever you want to get away with. And you choose to do what's right. That's character. Steph Curry got this multi-million dollar contract. And that's why you get in that game. I don't like when people tell children who desire that, well, you know, this is good and to be representative of your... 99% of them ain't thinking about no community. It's the money. It ain't nothing wrong with saying it. More of us would be happy if we would just tell the truth. It's the money. That's why you have agents. But character can shape money too if you let character get involved in it. If you're a Christian, by the way, Steph Curry is a Christian. Not in name only, but confessionally. I like that, that he's unapologetic about being a Christian, that people that know him, know him to be a Christian. He had a contract with Nike, millions of hundreds of millions of dollars he could have made. He said, great, and he said, I asked only one, I'm aware of them, may I write a verse of scripture on the bottom of the shoe? They said, no, we can't see that. And he said, no, I can't see it either. <laughs> A less prodigious company, Under Armour, on the rise, but certainly doesn't have the muscle that Nike has said, hey, if you sign with us, 
you don't just have to put the scripture location. You can write the whole scripture out. He said, I can see that. Y'all looking, but you're not listening. I, I can see that. The, the reality is his character shaped the way that he managed even his financial resources. And one of the ways that we really determine our depth of Christianity and spirituality is how we manage our financial resources. Not just how we give to God, but how you save, how you invest, how you put back into yourself, how you redevelop community. Preach, Pastor West. I don't hear you shouting now. There are many of you in here that God has financially, wonderfully blessed. And it's good with the car you drive and the house you live in and all that. But God never gives to us just to keep it for ourselves. It's always to make things better in the world where we live in. It's a tool. You want more? Give some of it away. Give some of it away. He saw it. I'm through now. It, 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 are these all the sons you have? I, Jesse said, yeah, that's it. I mean, that, that's a lie. That's the best I got. And a Benadab and Shama. I mean, that's it. I mean, what else you want? He said, well, I was ready to anoint, but God said, wrong one. And he told me he chose from your house a king. Is it another one somewhere? He said, yeah, but he's outside watching sheep. Don't you think he need to be here? Well, he's watching sheep. Let me give you something here. God has a way of camouflaging you until it's time to present you. Don't ever forget that. Some of y'all in obscurity now, and you think that God has forgotten you when God is just camouflaging you. And sometimes camouflage is for your protection. There are times where God can't expose you too soon because people might abort his purposeful plan. So he keeps you in camouflage until the stage has been set right. God had to clear everybody else out the way so nobody was confused about God's choice. They, everybody had to be gone. Nobody competes with this. Do you have somebody else? Yeah, I got one more. But he outside with the sheep, camouflage, hiding out. Like these insects in nature. Uh, the stick insect that camouflages itself and looks exactly like a stick or to look like the orchard mantis that can release colors that blends identically into the flowered orchards or the rock spider that can hide amidst the rock with its venomous bite by hiding in camouflage. God can put you in similar situations where you can Camouflage, blend in, but there's something different about you. Where well, is the other one? He's out with the sheep. That's what I need. A shepherd. That's what I need. Tell him to come on in here. David walks in, smelling like sheep, and said, How can I help you? I'm watching sheep. God said, that's what I need. I see somebody that sees the need to watch over my people. Anoint that boy with all. No wonder he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. No wonder he said that God can camouflage you. And some of you are angry and been out of shape and upset that God has not 
expose you at a certain time, stay in the camouflage. He got to clear the stage to make sure when he puts you there, everybody understand you're in the right place now. You're in the right place now. Let me sit down and tell you. So David now is anointed as king. And his anointing as king reminds us of some things that we ought never forget. It reminds us that that one man's frustration never, never stops the plans of God. Just because Saul didn't do it didn't mean that God had run out of options. God always got somebody on the back 40 that he can bring up on the front line. All you need to do is be ready, be doing what God called you to do. That is, some of you, the Lord want to call you up, but you're not in the right place. Be in a place of service so that when God starts looking for a replacement, he knows your name. That's a word that I tell preachers. That is, write your sermons out. Write an outline out. Even when ain't nobody asking you to preach, just get in the habit of writing out your little sermon. Write out your outline. Read your Bible. Because one day, somebody gonna need a preacher and God's gonna say, I got somebody. When they wasn't pastoring, when they wasn't in charge, they were serving me by preparing themselves. God is never without a witness. I got to sit down now. But let me tell you something else. Don't forget that God can choose you from the strangest places. He went down to Bethlehem. Bethlehem wasn't the capital. Bethlehem was not a cosmopolitan. It was not a metropolis. It's just a backwater village. And the only reason why we know it is because we sing old little town of Bethlehem. And somebody else came from that town. Have a good day. You know where I'm going now. Tell David to come on in here and let me anoint David but you see David is the lesser David he's the little David he's just setting the stage on the world's prop to get another David on the stage in fact 2,000 years later in the same little town there's going to be a greater David and his name is Jesus the Lord and he's going to show up and everybody's going to say the real king has come now. All hail the power of Jesus' name.